evil communications corrupt good manners. Man, in these last days, I would pray that we would really pay attention to what Paul's saying there. Okay, what he's saying is we can do things thinking that we're doing them for good reason. And what he's saying necessarily when he says evil communication, understand this, he's not saying you're swearing at one another. That's not what he's talking about. Evil communication is going contrary to doctrine. That would be evil communication. You understand? And so what he's saying is, hey, if you aren't walking according to his will, then even though you're trying to do things what you think is good and right, it's going to be corrupted because you're not walking according to his will. Does that, does that make sense? What in return happens when proper doctrine is not understood is inevitably the person will have a poor ministry behavior because they will not, truly, they will not be truly serving God in his will. Uh, i.e. Ephesians 5.17. Uh, walk in the Spirit so you don't fulfill the lust of the flesh. If we try to walk without knowing the direction we need to be going in, we can cause more problems that will get us farther away from doing His will. We can simply see this truth by looking at the Exodus picture, which we have spent so much time uh, trying to uh, uh, get us to understand that picture. God was not well pleased with them because they were not walking according to His will. The four big issues rear their ugly head time and time again. And I think we all know that that still rears its ugly head even today. It's idolatry, it's fornication, it's tempting Christ, and it's murmuring. The reality is, sadly, for as 1 Corinthians 10 states, many to walk their life on earth claiming to be Christian, doing so-called Christian things, yet are not being effective for God because they're not fulfilling His will. Sadly, if we're being honest about this, this is what becomes a dominant place of the Laodicean mentality today. The devil has an incredible gift to be able to get us focused on the wrong things. He has an incredible gift to put our feet in the ground on those things. He has an incredible gift to make us stand for those things. Saying we're even praying about it, yet nowhere in Scripture can we give evidence it's being authoritative. Remember what I said last week, man. It's true. We have such an incredible ability to lie to ourselves. We really do. And it's very difficult to get out of that Laodicean mentality when we're lying to, to ourselves and lying to each, you know, one another. And, and listen, it might not even be us even realizing we're doing it. You know, and, and we may have the we have may have the good manners of doing it. We have good intentions to what we're saying. And we think that problem is it's evil communication in the fact of in the in the reality of but it's not biblical and if it's not biblical there's where our problems will come in does that make sense okay um <clears throat> i want you to notice in uh, uh uh verse number one here it says that ye walk worthy okay it's like it's like what we say when we're over there in second timothy right Study to show thyself worthy and approved unto God. Rightly divided. Why does he have to say approved unto God? Because there's a possibility, what? That we're not approved. Okay, so why does he have to stay here to walk worthy? What's, what's the opposite of that? Because we could walk unworthy. And so he's pointing that out to us. Hey, there... Remember, the first three chapters were all about talking to Christians and how to doctrinally be right in the church. Now he gets to chapter 4, and he's saying, I beseech you, walk worthy. Why? Because we can be Christians walking unworthily. Yeah. Amen? I mean, not amen to that, but you, you see what I'm saying? Like, it can happen. And so we got to be careful. What I would say is, uh, if I were to say it, uh, uh, you know, in, in a way that might be better understood, what we have to understand is doctrine informs our responsibility of how our walk should go in our Christian life. Amen. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. That, uh, that, 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 is, that is absolutely true. If we are going to walk worthy, our worthy walk cannot be based on our thoughts, our opinions, the way we think the Lord wants it. 
No. If we're going to walk worthy, we've got to walk according to the word. Yeah? Amen? Okay. Therefore, as Paul says, we cannot be ignorant of these things. And furthermore, he makes the point to tell us that we need to have a worthy walk. And, and what I would say is, let me say it like this, maybe the walk must be informed by the Spirit. Capital S. Good? Okay? Uh, you know, in Romans 8, 1, he says this. And here's where I think, uh, here's another uh, layer in the church that I think we have uh, got to be really careful with. Okay, and so let me, let, me, let me read you what Paul says in Romans 8, and then let's talk about it for a second. He says, There is therefore no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. And unfortunately, now hear what I'm going to say, please. Unfortunately, that's where most people stop. No condemnation in me. I'm good. Whatever I do, there's no condemnation. Hold on, that's not the, that's not the whole verse. <laughs> okay, hold on. Let's keep reading. Who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. So there so then there is condemnation to those, whether you're Christian or not, who if you're not walking after the spirit, but walking after the flesh, there is condemnation. Now, is the condemnation your loss of salvation? No, of course that's not what he's saying. However, what does that word uh, uh, condemn mean? It means, uh, for all intents and purposes, is to pronounce a complete and utter disapproval of it. So, in other words, the condemnation that comes to God isn't about your salvation, it's that he utterly disproves what you're doing. That make sense? Okay, and, and that's important to know, I would think. I don't want to be walking in a way that is utterly disapproved by God, right? Does anybody want to do that? I, I certainly don't, and I certainly hope none of you do. We don't want that. We want to walk worthy. And so what I would say is not just knowing about it, it's about knowing what it actually means to walk worthy so that then uh, we can do it. Yeah, Amen. Okay, he goes on to say, beseech you. Okay, so we know back in Ephesians 2.10, we know that it says uh, uh, that we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should. Okay, so we're starting to put two and two together, if you will, if we start to uh, compare scripture with scripture. Okay, when we're talking about walking, what is he talking about? Well, what he's talking about is walking in good works. That's what he's talking about. That's what our walk is. And so if you stop and you think for a second in the Exodus, as they were walking toward the promised land, were they walking in good works? Well, no, because they were too busy doing the other four things that caused them to not walk in good works. Did God forsake them? Did God leave them? No. What God did is he stepped back and said, well, I'm going to give you just enough to sustain you while you're doing what you're doing, and I'm going to be long-suffering toward you. I'm going to do those things. But... At the end of the day, we got to get to the place where we get back on track and start walking in the, uh, in the way that we're supposed to. And that walk, therefore, uh, by comparing Scripture with Scripture, certainly has to do with doing good works. Uh, and by the way, wouldn't that be a vocation? A vocation is your work, right? So you, you see how all this is tying together? Um, and, 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 you know, the... the uh, the uh, uh, Ephesians 2.10 passage, uh, it says there that we should walk in them, which means it's a choice, right? You could choose not to walk in them, which at that point would make you have an unworthy walk. Y'all see how that goes together? Okay. Uh, what Paul is saying here is that now you know, Ephesians 1-3, through 3, you have a choice to do it. What you, should or what you should do, you have a choice to do what you should do, or you have a choice to do what you shouldn't do. But it's a good idea to know what you should be doing, because you cannot do it otherwise. <laughs> right? And, and furthermore, uh, you better understand that there's a great accounting for not doing it. Right? I mean, we could easily go to 1 Corinthians 4 to, to, to flesh that out. Okay? 
Thus, Paul is, uh, he's not just praying that we would do it. He's not just, oh, please do it. No, he's what? He's beseeching us to walk worthy. All right? Walk worthy in what? Again, it's that vocation. And by the way, it's a vocation that we've been called. And again, I'll say you must know what the vocation is before you can walk in it. Let me think here. here, here how can I explain this? So let's say, let's say, well, let's go back to that business model I, I talked about a couple weeks ago. Let's say, you know, I have a business and I hire you to work at my business. And I say, okay, um, so we, uh, I don't know, we deliver pizzas. We make pizza here at this business, Okay. It's Mother's Day. Let's do flowers. Okay. We have a flower business, okay? All right, so what I need you to do, I'm hiring you. What I need you to do is just sell flowers. That, that, that's all I said to you when you hired on. That's it. Okay, well, there's a lot of things that go into that, right? I mean, first of all, what you, how much are the flowers? Uh, how much should I charge? How do I work the cash register? Uh, what about delivery? Uh, who's delivering them? How are they going to deliver them? What about our customer service? What's going to happen when people don't uh, have a problem? Who's going to take it? I heard you and I just said, flower business, go to work. Well, the, as a boss, have I given you enough information to know how this business needs to run? No. There was no, there was no training. There was no nothing. Unfortunately, folks, that's the Christian today in many of a church. We have that end point of I'm saved. The problem is the training of how to do the vocation wherewith you were called to do is not happening. And so therefore, the walk isn't going according to the way God has announced it to be. Was that a good enough? Uh, I, I, uh, I think that's, you know, you, you, you and by the way, would it be unfair? Now think about this for a second. What if it, would it be unfair for me as the boss who hired you to come up to you like afterwards and be like, dude, why did you do that? What is wrong with you? Don't you see right there that it says $20 and you sold it for $10? What are you going to say to me? Well, you never told me. You just told me to go at it, man. So would it be fair for me to hold you accountable for that? Well, no, it wouldn't. However... God can fairly hold us accountable for things because it's in his book. And he has given it to us. The unfortunate, sad reality is uh, many today don't know what a worthy walk is, which is all the more reason why I think Ephesians is so important because Ephesians is the book that is going to lay out what a worthy walk is. Okay, so we've been called to a vocation. We certainly need to know what this vocation is before we can walk in it. To get good conduct, you must have a knowledge of your holy calling. The Christian life is a vocation, not a vacation. That was written by a gentleman by the name of Thomas McLean. And boy, does that speak loudly because it's so true. I think a lot of folks have that bit of a mentality. You know, uh, our life, you know, when we get saved, it's a vacation's all about who? <laughs> See, when I'm at work, it's all about who? See the difference? Like when I'm at work, I'm working for the company. You know, I'm working for the weekend, right? Uh, I'm not working for the five days that I'm in the work, in the job there. Little lover boy there for all you folks. I mean, listen, right? The, the hard part is the work. That's not easy. We don't like to, I mean, I don't know about you guys, man, but I, I don't know. Uh, do we love going to work 40, 50, 60 hours a week? No. Yeah. That's, oh, Bill does. All right, so that's good. But most of us in our right mind <laughs> don't. We don't. That's not our favorite thing. We'd rather be with our friends. We'd rather be with our family. We'd rather be doing other things out on the water, whatever, right? We want that part of it. That, so what we're going to see here, I mean, the very next verse, look what he says. Endeavoring. <laughs> we got we got to endeavor to do something. Well, when you have to endeavor to do something, that means you need to work at it. It's not going to come easy. Matter of fact, it's going to be very difficult. Yeah? Okay? All right. So, the Christian life 
uh, again, as McLean said, is a vocation, not a vacation. The calling and vocation here that we have is not earthly. Matter of fact, it's a high calling, Paul calls it, which now takes it and trumps it even bigger. This isn't just a job. I'm almost afraid to use this analogy. It's the president of the United States job. <laughs> like, this is a, a lot of people and a lot of things are going to be affected by what we do. It's a high calling. And certainly, as we, 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 we put that in a practical understanding for us, souls matter. Souls are at stake here. If we don't uh, walk accordingly, right? So Ephesians 1.18, if you remember, what Paul was praying about, he said, the eyes of your understanding would be enlightened that ye may know what is the hope of his calling. Okay, so we don't have to guess what that calling is we have the ability to know what the hope of our uh, his calling is and that we may know the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints in second timothy paul says be not therefore ashamed of the testimony of our lord nor of me his prisoner but be thou partakers of the affliction of the gospel according to the power of god who has saved us don't stop there who has saved us and called us with a holy calling not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus. By the way, back to what Ephesians 1.4 said, before the world began. Philippians 3.14, Paul says, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. So uh, let's, let's just stop for a second there, and let's just make sure that we all have the, uh, the, 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 the absolute understanding of what this high calling is. What is this thing, this vocation, where we should be walking? What, what is it? Uh, just to make sure that we all have it. Uh, it would go back to chapter 3, and it would go back to those last a uh, uh, few verses there. Um, well, you know, probably starting around verse eight um, is, is where we are. So, so, so number one, okay, what is our high calling? What is it that we're to walk worthy of? Well, number one is we need to proclaim the eternal riches of Christ. That that is number one. What we are to do to walk worthy. Okay, uh, Ephesians two seven. If you want to, we're going to do a little Bible aerobics. If you want to go with me, if not, just listen. Okay, it says, in whom we have, I don't know, I got to go to chapter two, that'd be better. Uh, it says that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace. Okay, so there's that. It's our job to proclaim the eternal riches of Christ. Colossians 1.27, if you want to jump over there with me real quick, you can. If not, uh, just uh, let's let God's word speak. It says, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Good? Okay. Uh, going uh, off of Colossians, in two, uh, verse, uh, chapter 2, verse 2, he says that their hearts might be com comforted, being knit together in love, unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding, to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of Father, of the Father and of Christ, and by the way, in whom all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge is, in Romans six, uh, no, in uh, uh, Hebrews eleven twenty six. <clears throat> Paul says this. I'm sure it's something good. I just got to get there. Uh, he says this, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. For he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. And so uh, what he's saying is, Moses, right? Uh, he didn't look for the earthly treasures. He wasn't looking for those things. He was looking for the heavenly treasures, i.e. what Paul was talking about in Colossians 1 and 2. And then, of course, chapter 3, verses 1, and 1 to 3 is absolutely the... the, the uh, uh, bringing it, that idea together. Because what Moses understood is that he had recompense for the reward. He couldn't see the reward, 
but he knew that that reward is going to be great, right? Uh, hence the reason why Jesus says, lay your treasures in heaven and don't uh, uh, lay your treasures on things of the earth because the things of the earth are going to corrupt. Okay, so number one, in our walk, we need to make sure we understand that our position and our vocation is to proclaim the eternal riches of Christ. Number two, uh, verse nine of chapter two, uh, three, excuse me, he says, reveal the eternal mystery of the church. Uh, Mark chapter four, uh, verse 11 uh, Jesus uh, says, uh, and he said unto them, uh, unto you it is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God. So unto who? Well, uh, us. We're, we're the kingdom of God, right? It says unto you to know that. But unto them that are without, these things are done in parables. They aren't going to understand what we're saying. They aren't going to get it. Does that make sense? So it's our job to reveal that to people who don't understand it. Uh, we've gone to Romans 16, 25, plenty of other times where, where Paul talks about how we need to reveal this mystery. Uh, Ephesians 3, 4, uh, it says, whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery. Okay, so obviously, then, uh, what Paul is driving at is he wants us to get a place where we understand what the knowledge of the mystery is. Which means, then, by default, we may not understand the knowledge of the mystery. Right? And so it becomes critical that we understand that knowledge, uh, if that makes sense. Uh, we could go uh, uh, back to Colossians chapter 2 we, and, and go through that again. Uh, the, the, the same principles are seen there. Uh, but what I might want to go to is 1 Timothy 3.9, where uh, when Paul is writing to the pastor of the church in, uh, in Ephesus, uh, he says this, right? When talking to the deacons, which certainly would be applicable to uh, not only the pastors, but also uh, the congregants, he says, holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. Well, faith cometh by and hearing by the... So for us to hold the mystery of the faith in pure conscience, the only way we can do so is if we know the word of God. Does that make sense? Okay, so for us to reveal the eternal mystery of the church, the only way we're going to reveal the eternal mystery of the church is to know the mystery of the church. Make sense? Okay. Number three is to display the eternal wisdom of God. And we see that in Ephesians 3, verses 10 through 11. Uh, I won't go and spend the time now. Uh, I think most of us uh, know uh, a great place we could go here when we're talking about the wisdom of God. We could go to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and we could read, you know, probably the whole chapter would be applicable to what we're talking about. But what we do want to take note of, okay, matter of fact, you know what, go to 1 Corinthians 2, because I do think there's one point that we probably should uh, all understand, myself included. As Paul's walking through this idea of what uh, 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 wisdom is, and how wisdom only comes by the word of God, you know, kind of when he gets to the, to the bottom end of that chapter there, uh, and, and, well, okay, so look at verse 7 there, I'm sorry. Uh, he says there, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. So there's your tie there, right? Uh, and, and certainly in verse 9, he tells us that uh, uh, there are things that uh, uh, I have not seen or ear heard, neither the entered into the heart of man, the things which God has prepared for them that love him. Verse 10, but God has revealed them unto us by his spirit so that we can search the deep things of God, right? But then he kind of gets to the bottom of there and he starts talking about how the natural man can't receive these things. The natural, so we can talk Bible all day long to somebody, but the natural man can't see it. Their, their eyes are blinded from it. Okay? Now, note that the natural man doesn't necessarily mean the unsaved man. Is everybody okay with that? 
Because it's going to say it in chapter 3. <laughs> okay, the natural man doesn't mean the unsaved man. Okay, so the natural man could be unsaved, but the natural man could also be a babe in Christ. Okay, and, and, and so that's an important distinction to being able to understand the knowledge. When you get to chapter 3, look what he says. Unto uh, and I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but, uh, but as unto carnal. The natural man, the carnal man, the one that is walking according to, what's carnality mean? Huh? Which, which means they're walking according to themselves. And he says, I can't. I can't, I can't talk to you, Christian church, in that way. Corinthian church, I can't talk to you in that way. Because you're not going to understand what it is I'm throwing down. You're only going to be able to be fed with milk as unto babes. Some of you are going to understand what I'm throwing down because you can be fed with the meat. Y'all see that? Okay. And so uh, that makes displaying the eternal wisdom of God very critical for all of us when we're out there because there's going to people, there are just going to be people, man, that we are talking to about Christ that they just do not know what we're throwing down. They can't, they're just not there. And we could talk to her blue in the face about it, and it ain't going to get us anywhere because they just do not have the ability to understand this book. And, and, and when I say it's not their fault, well, okay, it is their fault, okay, but when you do, when you, number one, don't have the Spirit of God in you, there is nothing you got to bring, you could talk to them about the rapture when the rapture is going to hurt, going to happen. You could talk about them about the second coming of Christ. You could talk to them about, you could talk about them about anything in the book you want. They are not going to get it. They just aren't going, they may act like they get it, but we all know they walk away, man. They didn't hear a word you said. They went one in and right out the other. Everybody going to talk to somebody like that? They can't get it. So the best thing we can do in that situation is we need to bring them the gospel. We need to get them to the point of salvation first so that the Holy Spirit can get inside of them because without that, they aren't going to get it. Right? right? Is, that, is, that, is, that, is that fair to say? Okay, but then you also have, and this is where the struggle comes uh, for leaders of the church like myself, then you also are going to have people who are saved. They do have the Spirit of God, but because they're babes in Christ, they don't get it. And that makes it very difficult because especially in a church like this where we throw down scriptural truth every week. And so some people, and this isn't a shot, I'm just, it's the truth. Uh, even, if, even if it's just simply this, some people have been here longer than others. Some people are going to be further along in their understanding of things than others. How do you navigate that? That's a difficult road you gotta you got to uh walk it really is but regardless we need to display the eternal wisdom of god nonetheless because that is part of our vocation and then finally the fourth thing that we see in that chapter three is we need to manifest the eternal glory of god the eternal glory of god and and, and i would then if we wanted to i could bring us to john 15 1 through 8 and talk about how god gets his glory he gets his glory, of course, how? By bearing much fruit. That's how he gets his glory. And how do, how do, we, uh, uh, how do we bear... Uh, bury. No, that isn't what we want to do. We definitely don't want to bury the fruit. Uh, how do we bear much fruit? How do we do that? Who said I heard it? By the work of the Lord. And then, of course, now you start cross-referencing that. You know where I'm going to go next, right? Uh, John 17 what is the work of the Lord? Well, the work of the Lord is uh, winning people to Christ, building them up in their faith, and sending them out to do the same thing. That is how he gets his glory. And I would remind you what Jesus said in John 17, verse number uh, 4, which I think is very, very important. He says, I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. 
God can be glorified on the earth. We are the body of Christ. And just as he walked, we walk. He was the way. We're called the way. He was the life. We have that life in us. He was the truth. And we are the pillar and ground of truth that comes from that book. We're tying things together here. And we're going to need to rightly divide our word of truth to get to the place where we're getting. But nonetheless, this is the, uh, the truth of the matter. What makes it worthy? This chapter separates the importance of how we conduct ourselves in the body of Christ. If, if I can just say it like this, if y'all can be respectful, respect how I'm saying it. it go, it's the difference between us playing church if I, if I could say it that way, and, or in how we conduct ourselves toward each other in the body of Christ. So there, you know, if we're not walking worthy, are we playing church or what's going on there? Call it what you want, get it to where you want, but the mat- fact of the matter is, uh, I think many of us know, uh, and many of us probably have suffered through it, I've suffered through it certainly, uh, where we've played church, if we're being honest. You know, we just really weren't into it that day, or we just really weren't into it that month, or man, we had a tough six months. Okay, so we all have those, those times where that can happen, uh, uh, but, the, but, the, but the point is, when we're doing that, we're probably not walking worthy of the vocation we were called. Yeah? Okay? The point is, uh, and what Paul's trying to get us to, is, is that these aren't suggestions, These are practical applications to doctrinal truths that we must, as he's going to say in in, in verse 3, endeavor to do. Endeavor to do individually and corporately. Because that's what what, what, what he's going to do here in chapter 4. Like like I said last week, the first verses 11 to 16, somewhere in that area there, that's all corporate stuff. And then verse 17 to the end of the chapter, uh, verse uh, 32, right? Uh, That's all all going to be individual stuff, okay? And so that's how he's laying this thing down. They're not suggestions. Uh, we we, We must endeavor to do them. Ye are called. It is God's calling for you, for me, for this church to fulfill his will. Okay, here's the the hard part, guys. It's not God's calling to fulfill your will. That's not what God's looking for. He's looking for us individually and us corporately to fulfill his will. We could take the time right now and go through the seven wills of God. (laughs) What is his will? Well, his will is going to be tied, all seven of them, to the work of the Lord. Uh, and if you've been uh, into any of the times when we've, we've studied that out, you would know that that is, that is true. Um, so, uh, and then he says with lowliness, you know, esteeming others better than yourself. Uh, always giving the benefit of the doubt. When we think we are better than when, what well, we really are, we have an incredible ability to lie to ourselves then we are going to hold other people accountable for things that we probably should be careful of. Okay, and what does, what, I mean, I could give you a bunch of verses on that, but, you know, Proverbs 16, 19 says, better is it to be of a humble spirit with a lowly than to divide the spoil with the proud. Romans 12, 3 says, for I say, though the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, accordingly as God has dealt to every man, the measure of faith. And interestingly enough, he ties that to faith. For us to think soberly and not to think of ourselves more highly than others, faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God, right? And then Philippians 2, 3 says, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory. But in lowliness of mind, let each other esteem others better than themselves. And of course, we all know that is a very difficult thing to do. And then, of course, back in Ephesians 4, he talks about with meekness. And so this is a word that I think we, we need to look at real quick. Listen, meekness is not weakness, okay? It's not to avoid confrontation. 
A lot of people think that's the case. No. What it is, is meekness would be a milder response to provoking. Does that make sense? Like, no. Like, truth is truth. But, you know, we all know that... Uh, you stupid idiot, you're a moron. Why are you doing it that way? Okay, maybe you're right. Okay, but man, <laughs> person's probably not going to receive it all that well if you say it that way, right? Or, hey, man, dude, what you, what's up, man? Why'd you do it that way? What's wrong with you? People might be more open to... The fact of the matter is the truth was the truth. Right. It's still truth, right? And, and what, what, uh, what I would say is, Okay, and this is where kind of Paul's going with all this. What I would say is, but if somebody did come to you and go, you freaking idiot, what's wrong with you? You're a moron. I can't believe you did it like that. Okay, what are you going to do with that? How are you going to react to that? Well, are you going to react to that with anger and get upset at that person and never talk to him again? Or are you going to go, you know what, man? I know you had a moment. <laughs> what you said is right. And, and, and I appreciate that you loved me enough to say it. But maybe next time you can say that a little nicer <laughs> or be a little more. Our reaction to things is going to matter and how we respond to them is going to matter. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. And we need to all learn to do that. That's a tough thing. It's a tough thing because let's be honest, myself included, our flesh, <laughs> we, we don't like things like that, right? But I do want to note some passages in the Bible uh, that I think are, are things that we should give uh, uh, ear to. You remember when uh, Paul was writing to the Corinthians over there? Of course it would be the Corinthians, wouldn't it? And in 1 Corinthians 4.21, he says this, What will ye? Shall I come to you with a rod? Now, if I come with you a rod, what's that? You're about to get beaten. This is going down. This is going to hurt. Right? And he says, Shall I come with you with a rod? Or would you have me come with you in love? In other words, hey man, I'm not even, I'm not even going to talk to you about the fact that you did wrong. I'm just going to love you. It's kind of like the way we want church to be these days. You know, hey man, don't, 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 don't do that. Just, just love me. It's my ears, right? Or do you want me to come in the spirit of meekness? Or do you want me to come in the spirit of meekness? Okay, now, all of us are going to look at that and go, well, see, you don't come with a rod. All of us are going to look at that and see you don't come in love. What I'm going to say is the spirit of meekness is doing both. Sometimes you have to come with a rod. Let me show you. Proverbs 13, 24 says, he that spareth his rod hateth his son. Whoa. When you don't bring the beating, you hate your son. Look at that. Uh, uh, but he that loveth him chasteneth him. Oh, that's the wrong verse. No, no, that's the right verse. But he that loveth him, chasteneth him be times. That's an interesting word. That's not a word we use today. Matter of fact, when I read that, I'm like, what the heck does be times mean? I don't even know what that means. Uh, okay, so I had to look that up. Let me tell you what it means. On occasion, when needed. Sometimes the occasion calls for a rod. And if the rod doesn't get brought, well, what does that say there? You hate your son. So there's a great application to people who say, well, you can't spank your, your kids. Well, yes, you can. Matter of fact, there's a time when you need to spank your kids. And I'll tell you, man, I've had to spank Peyton a few times in his life. One time he even chose spanking over sitting on the bed, which was crazy. I think that was the last time I spanked the dude. I think he had it figured out after that. He knew. Okay, but, 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 but does anybody think that I like spanking him? Does anybody think I, I was like, oh man, Peyton did bad today. Give me that. Can't wait to ask. Dude, it hurt my hand more than it hurt his butt. I promise you. My dad, I remember my dad. My dad did not, I did not grow up with my dad. He was out of the house by the time I was four. And I would see him maybe once every year or two. But I do remember one time I was visiting him. And I remember, listen, my mom disciplined way differently than my dad did okay okay my dad was italian my dad man he, he he we'll put it like this i remember when i was younger me and my me and my cousin we were over at my grandpa's house one night and we stole do you remember those jello pops 
know what I'm talking about? The Jello Pops, the chocolate Jello Pops. Do they still make those today? No, they're called Jello Pops. I know what they're called, man. We used to eat them all the time, man. They were good. Okay, we would sneak out in the middle of the night and we'd steal them and we'd eat them, right? Well, one night my grandpa, he knew he, he caught on that something was up and he caught us and he took his shoe and he beat the crap out of my cousin with his shoe. Okay, I don't know why he didn't beat the crap out of me. Maybe because I was younger, I don't know. But my cousin, he got it laid down. So I remember, man, I was, over, I, was, I was with my dad once, man, and I did something that I probably shouldn't have been doing, I'm sure, and he didn't put me up against the wall. He didn't, no, he beat me with a plastic bat. And every time he hit me, you want to know what he said? This hurts me more than it hurts you. No, it don't. I'm the one getting in the butt right now. <laughs> right? But the point is, I don't know... Maybe he did enjoy it. I don't know. All I know is I don't enjoy that. I certainly never enjoyed hitting my son to the point that I've never spanked my daughter, which probably, she gets me every time, man. I can't. I, can't. I just cannot. But it, that's not to say that I shouldn't have, uh, <laughs> for sure. Uh, but he's probably sitting there going, this ain't fair. Dude, you hit me, but you don't hit her? What's wrong with this picture? Okay, anyways. Um, Proverbs 22.15 says, Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction shall drive it far from him. And, and I do want to tie that with that 1 Corinthians 3 passage. We are what? There are what, I should say? Babes in Christ. Okay? Notice the, 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 the connection there. So, Sometimes babes in Christ need to get a rod of correction. Okay? And then Proverbs 29, 15 says, the rod and reproof. And, and I think this is the perfect... Okay, so why would I spank my child? Just to spank them? They got nothing better to do? No. For what? Well, that Proverbs 29 passage gives us a good indication to why we do it. It's to give wisdom. To learn from our mistakes, to learn, okay, I do that right there, dad gonna come spank me, and I don't like that, so I'm gonna stop doing that, right, I mean, hopefully we learn, <laughs> unless you just like getting spanked a lot, right, unfortunately, some like getting spanked a lot, and they don't like it, but they just want to keep going back to the same things that caused the spanking. Regardless, uh, uh, what Paul is getting at here is that the church body conducts itself and pictures a family. Sometimes the dad needs to come with a spirit of meekness. Sometimes the dad needs to come in love. Sometimes the dad needs to come with a rod. Different situations require different responses. But all of them are valid. Chastening is not fun. It never is. However, and please hear me on this, it is a sign of love. And it is necessary. It's a component of growth. If I, if, if I didn't hold him accountable to his actions, he would continue to do the things that he shouldn't be doing. Man, I think all of us can probably look at our nation today and go, we could use a good spanking right about now. All, a lot of us could use a good spanking. You want to know why? Because we've gotten to a place in our society where, no, just love everybody. Just everybody, you just do what you want to do, and we'll just love you. And whether it's right, wrong, or indifferent, who are you to decide is right, wrong, or indifferent? Who, what makes you think you... Well, okay, I agree with that. What does make me or anybody else for that matter, their opinion, become the judge. No. If we would just keep this as the judge, then we would have a difference between right and wrong. We would know what we should be doing and what we should be doing. Anyways, remember what Jesus said to the Laodicean church in, in Revelation 3.19? As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Uh, I was talking with somebody this week and we were talking and, 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 and you know, that word rebuke, uh, there's, a, there's an interesting tag to that. And, and, and here is, is Richard 
beating that child back there? Is he giving that child a little rod right now? What's going on back there? Um, he's doing it in love. There you go. Or either that, it's my daughter. Uh, it's one of the two. I don't know. Uh, but, uh, you know, there's something about that word rebuke that I think is it's very difficult for us to wrap our brains around. Um, you know, we can look at, uh, what is it, 1 Timothy 3, 4, where he says, preach the word, in season, out, se- out of season. And then he says, Re- rebukes one of those words he uses, right? And then when you go to uh, chapter 4, uh, he says, those that sin, rebuke before all. <sighs> we don't like that, do we? And James tells us, in uh, 417, right, for the last verse in, in James, James says, they that know to do good and do it not, to them it is sin. Man, start tying some of that stuff together. Okay, so, hey, I've been telling you, brother, <laughs> you need to do this. You're not doing it. I have rebuked you about that. I have told you not to do that. We can't do that. That isn't going to work. Not in this family. Okay? Not under my roof, right? <laughs> Dads, y'all know what I'm talking about. When you're, when you're, you ain't doing it. Now, as long as you're under my roof, that ain't going down like that, right? Y'all know what I'm talking about? Okay? But what it says is, when that's happening in a uh, family environment, rebuke before all. Why? Why would, why would God want us to do that? That sounds so counterproductive to our thinking in our society. However, why you do that is because it teaches everyone else. It teaches everyone else. Dang. Okay. It's an important part of it. Galatians 6, 1, Paul says, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in fault, ye which are spiritual... Restore such a one in the spirit of meekness. So when someone's not doing what they're supposed to be doing, either because they don't know to do it or they're spiritually not in a place where they uh, can do it, okay, us that are spiritual and that do understand, we should be going to that person and we should be saying, hey, bro, sister, we got to step up our game here. We got to step up our game because what will ultimately happen as the verse says there, because if you don't, if we don't, why do we rebuke before all? Because if you don't, you want to know what will happen. It's almost like God wrote the book and he knows what will happen. What will happen is that person will start to wear off on you. And then you'll start thinking the same way that person's thinking. And then you'll start going, yeah, that ain't right. Or yeah, the ultimate, the ultimate way murmuring starts. It's the ultimate way murmuring starts. And that's what happens. It will flow over. And then, of course, uh, we got bigger problems, right? Listen, we have many different people within this body. We have very different levels of understanding, and the question is, how are we going to respond when uh, uh, somebody doesn't have an understanding or they provoke you about something? Not everyone is at the same spiritual level. The blurred line that makes it so difficult is when someone has been walking for three, four, 10, 20 years, and they still don't get it. That's a very tough line to walk. They're still babes in Christ years later. It's a very frustration, uh, frustrating place to navigate. It really is. And listen, I'm going to tell you guys, man, uh, I have had people come to me frustrated with other people about things. Uh, and here's the problem. They're right what they're saying. But on the same vein, we've got to endeavor to keep the unity in the spirit. So whether right, wrong, or indifferent, what I have tried to do 
and again, I will say right, wrong, or indifferent, what I have tried to do is take their frustration and put it on me instead of, I don't want people turning on one another. I'd rather y'all, you know, not not saying y'all are, but I'd rather y'all be mad at me. Don't get mad at one another. Because if we start getting mad at one another, then then that's a church split. That's when really bad things happen. But, you know, I get a lot of this stuff all the time. Every day I get stuff. And it does become frustrating. And part of the frustration, and I get it because I feel it at times, is, man, this person's been around here for how long? Come on, man. What the heck? Why aren't they? Y'all understand what I'm saying? And so uh, what we have to do, though, and, 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 and it's a lesson that I think I'm learning in this area, and, and I might share this with you. The fact of the matter is, you can want it for someone else. You can have such an obsession to the point of pain for you. But if they do not want it, you can't force it on them. Right. And I think that's probably where I've gone wrong, is I've wanted it so badly for other people that I've tried to force things on them. Everyone has a choice to make. Either they want it or they don't. But the point is, and this is probably what I would say and what I've learned, especially over the course of the last couple of weeks, you can't be anyone's Holy Spirit. And that's the truth. It is a reality. It does not mean we don't try to restore them. It does not mean that we do not continuously and tirelessly try to get them to do what it is they're supposed to be doing. What it does mean is you just can't force it. Then he talks about long-suffering, which is a, descriptive, is a descriptive of charity. 1 Corinthians 13, uh, brother... Uh, 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 yeah, how... I don't know why I wanted to say Robert. I just kept wanting to say Robert, but I knew it wasn't right. Brother Claude <laughs> preached a message, uh, I don't know, a month or two ago uh, on charity. He, we walked through uh, 1 Corinthians 3, uh, which was a good message. Y'all should go back and listen to that if you weren't here for that. But, but what it says there is, charity suffers long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself. It's not puffed up. And one of the most important things I think we need to, to learn is that I need to suffer long with you. You need to suffer long with me. We need to suffer long with each other. I need to forgive you. You need to forgive me. We need to forgive one another. It's what should happen in our marriages. It's what should be happening in our relationships with family members. It's obviously because the church is a picture of the family, what should be happening in a church. We need to learn to forgive. We are all prone to making mistakes. We are all prone to... Probably shouldn't have done it that way. Maybe that wasn't the right way to go about that. However you want to do that. But it doesn't mean... It doesn't mean, you know, I mean, do me and my wife ever get in arguments? I never argue with her because I'm always right. But she just, for some reason, feels like she needs to argue with me about some stuff. And we all know that's wrong. Uh, But listen, but we get into arguments. Uh, But, you know, one thing that I love about our marriage that I think is absolutely important, we never dwell on it. We never do. I mean, I've even heard Chris say sometimes, man, you guys were freaking about ready to kill each other five minutes ago, and now it's like everything's fine. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. Don't. Because if you do, the Satan will grab onto that and he'll run with it. And he'll run with it. He'll tear your marriage apart. He'll tear your relationships apart with one another. And he'll tear you apart from your church. If you let Satan get in there, no. Don't let... Don't let the sun go down on your anger. Get with that person if you need to. Have a conversation with them. Do those things. And if you're asking, does all this apply? Yes. Look at the next verse. It says we need to endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit. This absolutely 100% applies to what we're talking about. Uh, That word forbearing. That word forbearing means to withhold wrath. Uh, accompanied by forgiveness. We forgive people that sin uh, uh, because that person, uh, we, we forgive people because that sin that person committed against you is no different 
than the sin that we committed against Christ. And he forgave and shed his blood for us on the cross. So therefore, we should be forgiving one another. We should be forgiving one another. This starts with a knowledge of what it means to put on the new man in the first place. It's not transforming your flesh into something. That is impossible to do. And I think that's what a lot of people think that they, how, how they solve the problem. No, you can't transform your flesh into something. Your flesh is desperately wicked. Who can know it? No, the, the answer is, and truthfully, this is why so many people get it wrong and suffer the consequences of it. In your flesh dwells no good thing. It doesn't matter how hard you try. You will never put on the new man in your flesh. Therefore, the practical lesson we can learn from this is how do we know we are walking in the flesh and not walking in the spirit? Well, here we go. When you're not forgiving, when you're not forbearing, when you're not being long-suffering, when you're not being merciful, when you're not being kind, when you're not being humble, what do you think you're walking in? And if you want the if you want the telltale sign of where I'm at right now, there it is. If you're not doing those things, then you're walking in the flesh. You're not walking in the spirit. Is, is, that, is that okay? And the final thing I'm going to say, and we're done for today, it says here, one another in love. So we'll, we'll tie up chapter two, uh, not chapter two, verse two, and then we'll pick up verse three in a couple weeks. There are over 40 one another's found in the Bible. It's one of the strongest references of those 40 one another's is to love one another, care for one another. Everybody, please pay attention. Everybody look up and pay attention to what I'm about to say. Ready? If you start to break down those love one another's, what? Break down those loving one another's, <laughs> okay? Caring for one another in the good, in the bad, no matter what kind. Kind of like what is said when you make a say it a wedding vow. Isn't that interesting? We could go through all those level, those forty level. My gosh, I can't even say it. That's that's a tongue twister right there. Uh, we could go through, and we all know I have a lot of tongue twisters. Okay, so we can go through. Uh, uh, who's going to write the book? Frank's isms. Yeah, we need we need that book. Thank you. Please do. You can all put your names on it as part authors. Uh, I will. I'll buy the book because I think it'll be great. It'll be fantastic. I can. I will laugh right along with you because I know uh, that I <laughs> have those issues. Um, but anyways, isn't it interesting that when you look at those lo love one another's in the Bible, those forty, man, you're going to be able to take all of those and tie them into a marriage. All. Not just some of them, all of them. You need to do all of them in a marriage. It's, 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 it's such a fantastic thing. Because here's the deal. What Paul is getting at here is as he goes through chapter number four, remember what comes in chapter number five, especially the second half of the chapter. He's setting up the great mystery of Christ in the church and how it reflects the marriage between the husband and the wife. And what Paul's getting at here as he's setting up that picture, and by the way, he calls that a great mystery. He is getting ready to reveal what he's going to talk about there in the end of chapter 5. And of course, there's a great lesson to learn in that. In today's church culture, we treat church like a place we go to or a thing we do. We must be careful of this ideology. If I can humbly say that it is biblically incorrect on every level. Church is a similitude of a family unit. For the family unit to conduct itself in a biblical manner, those in need, uh, to, those need to, we need to know our place in the family. We have pastors in the family. We have congregants in the family. We have children in the family, and I don't just mean children. Okay, that, that is biblical, what I just said right there. We have babes in Christ, and we have other people that have matured uh, more in their faith. 
that's all part of the family unit. Uh, and, and then what we need to do, uh, once we kind of get that understanding, is we need to know how to respond biblically, thus properly, when difficulties arise. Because if we think that difficulties aren't going to arise, we're out of our minds. Anybody got the perfect family? No difficulties ever in the family at all? <laughs> no. Difficulties are going to arise. And let me just say this. Let me just say this. Who, who doesn't want the family unit to work? Who would want to attack the family unit? Of course he would. Because he knows what it pictures. And so not only will he attack the family unit from a physical, you know, the Salvaggio family or the Ingle family or, or whatever. He'll attack those families, okay? But he'll also, of course he'll attack the church family. Of course he will. Why wouldn't he? He knows how to break it down. And he's very good at it. The mentality in church today, unfortunately, is very similar to the mentality in our marriages. Am I wrong? When things don't work out, when we get to the place where we, uh, uh, you know, we're not getting what we, we want out of it or we're not getting what we need out of it or, or, or you're not doing it the way I would do it, or oh, what happens? What's, what's the mentality today? It's pushed. I'm driving, down, I'm driving down the expressway, man, and I see the signs. What? Divorce. That's where we go to. Because this, because, Why? It's the easy way out. That's easy. That's simple to do. I'll just leave. Okay, but what does the next verse say? Endeavoring to keep the unity. What Paul's trying to get at is, this is going to be hard work. It's going to be the hardest thing you ever did. Nonetheless, you need to endeavor to keep it. You need to endeavor to keep it. I would strongly urge that we put away this ideology because it is from Satan who wants to destroy the family unit. And what we need to learn is the importance of how, and how critical it is in our maturity to work things out with one another and to treat one another right. That's Ephesians 4, 17 to 32. For better or for worse, we are in this together. What I do is I promise you this. I will make this promise to you. I'll always have your back. I know what the Lord saved me from. And I know he has had mine. So it is therefore prudent for me to always have yours. I honestly love every one of you. And I pray for every one of you individually and corporately. It is in my heart to always have your best interest. And this church is best interest in mine whenever I do something. And I'm sorry that I don't do it always the right way or, 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 or what, 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 what uh, you know, however that goes. But I promise you that because if I don't do that, I'm going against scripture, number one. I'm going against God, number two. And truthfully, it's only going to hurt me in the end. Okay, Paul's getting ready to move on now. Uh, after explaining the importance of loving one another and forbearing one another and the importance of keeping to now, he's going to get ready to start to talk about the importance of keeping the unity of the spirit in the church. And we'll pick up uh, verse number three uh, in a couple weeks. Um, some of you probably noticed you don't have a workbook. <laughs> okay, what I'm going to do is a little bit something different about that workbook going forward. Okay, um, and, and, and again, this is no... I'm not taking shots at anybody or anything. I'm just being honest, okay? Uh, about half of the people bring their workbook and fill it out, and about the other half don't, okay? It costs Ray a lot of money to do that, okay? So instead of just giving everybody a workbook that some of us, that's just not their thing, whatever, uh, what I'd rather do uh, instead of putting Ray out on that is what I'm going to do is, Justin, I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm going to email you my notes for the day, okay? And then he can put that up on the website, you can go back and pick up the notes at the end of the day uh, whenever, or early the next day, whenever, whenever Justin gets to it. Can we commit to at least having it done by Monday? Okay. It'll be up there by, by Monday at the latest. Okay? Would you, would you want to put it on the church's personal Facebook as 
Sure, sure. Um, no. The reason why I say is, yeah, well, no. No, I don't really necessarily know that. Uh, let them, if they want it, let them go get it. Yeah. Now, if you want the book, here's a good thing. I have it. And so if you want it, email me, and I'll send it to you, and you, you can still have the book. Okay? Fair? That way we don't have to put Ray out. We don't have to have him print. Because Ray always goes above and beyond. And, you know, he does it all for free. He doesn't even charge the church. And that's expensive to, 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 to print a 40-page booklet and then to print 40, 50, 60 of them, right? So I just would rather be uh, more prudent with uh, his resources and, and what he has provided for us. And, and it, the avenue is still there to get it. Uh, just, uh, you're just going to have to take one extra step to get there. Okay, uh, that's it. We're done. Who would like to pray? Do we have a mic we can give them real quick? Whoever is that person? Huh? I, I don't know. Who would like to pray? Who? You? Aaron said he, Aaron said he was going to pray. Hello? Dear Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for uh, Pastor and the time that he's taken to present us and prepare uh, your word for us. I would just pray that uh, we all take, no matter what it is, just something from it, that we can add it to our um, library or repertoire, that when we're out in the world that we have something to lean back on and remember of you and that you would call to our membering, that we'd be ready to always give that answer, that we'd just be ready for the conversations that you prepared for us. Um, we thank you again for all the mothers, um, for it is Mother's Day, because obviously without them, uh, we wouldn't be here. So we just want to thank you for them, and I just ask that, uh, that this day would be a special day because we're, families are getting together, that um, some families who don't know you or family members who don't know you, that we could use this time to just have those conversations. And if not, that we can just um, be with you and them in fellowship. And we just thank you for this day and ask you for protection as we go out into the world to uh, do your work that we can just do about it humbly. In your name we pray. Amen.